All right, so, you ready? Mm -hmm. All right. So this first session, we're going to talk about Bible prophecy. Now, about a week ago on a Sunday morning, we did kind of an introduction to Bible prophecy. And that video it was about 20, 25 minutes long, about 30 minutes long, before we jumped into a game of Jeopardy. Those of you who were here, we played Je uh, Jeopardy. That was a lot of fun. But that video is going to be cut and split, and it will be the first video in our series. So if you haven't seen that, feel free, uh, maybe later this week when we get the link out to you, you can watch that video as an introduction to our series tonight. But tonight we're going to talk about Bible prophecy being history in advance. Now why is it possible for Bible prophecy to be history in advance? How is it possible? The Bible. Yeah. Right? So what is it about the Bible that makes it be able to predict history in advance? It's true. It's true, but why do we know that? Word of God. Because it's the Word of God? Because who's the author? Oh. The purported author of the Bible. Yeah. Right? It's God, right? So who else has the capability to predict history in advance? <laughs> no one. Nobody. Really? Nobody, Nobody does. Only God does, right? Yeah. Uh, you don't have other people who will make attempts. We talked about this in our, in our preview class. Attempts to predict prophecy. But then they might get right sometimes. But how do you know a true prophet from God's word? What is one of the tests of a true prophet with respect to that person's predictions? It's all true. true. It comes true how many times? 100%. Every time, right? If it doesn't come true, that makes him a false prophet, right? You can identify them right away. Now, there are a lot of prophecies that we're going to look at throughout the uh, throughout our course that may have, some of them may have been fulfilled completely, some of them may be partially fulfilled, and some of them will have future fulfillments. You'll also see, as we did in our, pre in our preview class, we read a prophecy that Jesus was quoting from the book of Isaiah where it was, he stops right in the middle of the verse, right in the middle of the phrase. And he did that intentionally because in that case, he was saying, today this prophecy is fulfilled in your presence, but only a portion of the prophecy was fulfilled. Right. The rest of it is going to be future fulfillment. So we're going to talk about that a lot. A lot of what we're going to talk about is future fulfillment of Bible prophecy. All right now, as we do this, we asked this question in our previous class, is Bible prophecy relevant today? What do you think about that? Yes. Absolutely. Why do you think it is today? Yeah. You can see it happening, absolutely. We live in an incredible um, era of time, right? We have read these Bible prophecies, and now you are starting to see some of them come true. One of the things we're going to talk about tonight, the main topic tonight, is a biblical prophecy that has come true. So we're going to start off this uh, series by showing you prophecy that has come true for some of you in your lifetime, and for some of us, hey, in, in, the, most, in, the, in the near recent past, right? And then we're going to know... That from the proof that God's word is true, the proof of fulfilled prophecy, we can know for certain that future prophecy that has not yet occurred will come true. All right? We're going to look at a verse here from 2 Peter chapter 2. It says, we has, also have the prophetic message as something completely reliable. This is Peter, the apostle, who was one of Jesus' best friends, writing to the church. And he's telling the church, we have the prophetic message as something completely reliable. Now, Peter is not referring to the New Testament. Why is he not referring to the New Testament? It hadn't been written, it hadn't been written yet. So what is Peter talking about? The Old Testament. The Old Testament. The Old Testament. He's talking about the prophecy of the Old Testament. He's, he's saying, we have this message as something completely reliable, and you would do well to pay attention to it. He's talking now to who? Who's the audience? Who's he writing to? Church. He's writing to the churches. All right? He's writing to Christians. He's, so he's writing to us. You would do well, Christians, to pay attention to prophecy, to Old Testament prophecy, mm -hmm. as to a light shining in a dark place. So he's going to give us the hope that prophecy is a light in a dark place, right? Have any of you ever felt like the world that we're living in is becoming a darker, darker place? Yeah. Yeah. So God's Word would tell us that prophecy is a light in a dark place. It is something that we can see and have hope in, right? Mm -hmm. Until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, and above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretations of things. For prophecy never had its origin in the human will. But prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So the biblical authors are going to say, hey, hey, don't hold us up. We're nothing great. They're not giving prophecy in order to be held up on a pedestal. They reveal prophecy as given them by God to point people to God, right? To point people to God's word and to point people to God. One of the prophecies that we saw consistently in the minor prophets, the major prophets of the Old Testament, is a prophecy about the nation of Israel, right? So, does the nation of Israel exist today? 
Yes. Yes. yes, it does. All right. Had we held this class a hundred years ago, would the nation of Israel existed? No. 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 How many years before the nation of Israel existed? When did it go out of existence, by the way? 70 AD. 70 AD. What happened in 70 AD? Temple was destroyed. <clears throat> Rome was destroyed. Who comes in? They're destroyed. Israel is completely destroyed by the Roman, Roman occupation, right? They destroy, basically, they take the heart out, they rip the heart out of the nation by destroying what city? Jerusalem. And what was in Jerusalem? What was the main edifice in temple. Jerusalem? The temple. They, they destroy the temple, right? How did Jesus say what happened? Every stone would be removed, right? Right? The Jews were, ah, it's never going to happen. That'll never happen, right? That's exactly what happened. Why did, why did every stone get removed? Do you remember from your history? Because of gold, right? They wanted the precious metals that were uh, outlining the stones. Rome comes in, destroys the entire, just rips the heart out of Israel, right? And the nation ceases to exist. For how long? Until 1948, right? Until 1948. Well, as we start talking about this topic, we're going to go back in history just a little bit. We're going to go way back in history, all right? Because the focus of tonight's lesson is the nation of Israel being a prophetic fulfillment, right? The existence of a country that disappeared off the face of the earth for centuries and is now back, all right? And we're gonna see that that miraculous occurrence is directly related to the Bible, right? The Bible foretold that it would happen and it now has happened in some of your lifetimes, right? It happened before I was born, but some of you guys were alive. Mm -hmm. Israel was formed as a nation by whom? This is not making it difficult to answer all this question. Is this a trick question? So, all right, go. I'm here in the summer. Some of you guys have been working all day long, but the answer is like right there. So, Israel was born by whom? God. All right, by God, right? So, God, right, is the one who chooses that this nation is going to exist, right? God forms the nation. He does that by calling a single individual, who his name is? Abraham. Abraham, right? He becomes Abraham, right? He calls him out of Mesopotamia. When, did he see, when does he do this? 2100 BC. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> For those of you who don't have your With glasses, authority, quite good glass. <laughs> you may read the screen as Chris did. Or did that Chris? Who? One of these Chris's did. 2100 BC. How long ago was that? 4,000 years ago, right? So then Abraham's family, we, we go through the Old Testament, right? Abraham's family and his descendants are miraculously preserved through war and famine and 400 years of forced slavery in Egypt until about 1450 BC, right? That's the next major event we're going to talk about. And that's where God gives the law to one of Israel's Old Testament prophets. Who does God give the law to? Moses, right? Called a friend of God. He gives the law to Moses at Mount Sinai, right? And the law will include ceremonial law, civic law, religious law, right? He takes this nation of slaves, and he's going to bring them into a land and give them their own country. And so he's going to define this nation, right, that he chose, this nation that's called Israel. By the way, bonus points, three points. Anyone who can tell me what the word Israel means? To struggle with God. Struggle with God or wrestle with God. That's exactly right. Isn't that an appropriate name for the nation of Israel? Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Genesis 15, 18 to 21, which I'm going to give you all the notes so you guys can go back and look at this. God will not only uh, give the land to Abraham, but he's going to tell him what the boundaries of the land will be. So God, just, God controls not only who gets the land, but exactly the parameters of the land, right? The, uh, what do you call them, borders of the land. Now, are the borders of the land of Israel in dispute at all? Yes. Yes. A little bit. Do you ever hear about that? <laughs> like right now? Define dispute. Right? Define dispute. <laughs> right? Absolutely the borders are in dispute. But who ultimately controls the borders? Israel. God does. Leviticus 25-23, we won't look it up tonight during class, but go back and look it up. Leviticus 25-23 will say God owns all the land. God owns it. God is one who is sovereign. He's the one who controls who owns land. All right? The Bible will say that the land belongs to God, and it will also tell when, when God gives Moses the uh, Mosaic law, and he talks about the land that they're getting ready to go into, he's going to say that the land covenant, the promise to give them the land, was conditional. Right? What was it conditional to? Obedience. Yeah, it's on the screen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not asking. Good job, Lane. Yeah, very good. Good. <laughs> good. I'm going to tell you the guys on this side, 
can just they read a lot faster than <laughs> At halftime, we'll just let you guys can feel good about yourselves like sitting over here. But it was conditional to their obedience, right? Obedience to what? All right, this isn't Sunday school. All right, yes, to the law, right? He gives them the law, and he says, look, your presence in the land is conditional to your obedience of the law, all right? And he says specifically, there are rewards for your obedience, all right? God doesn't do anything without telling us in advance. God is, I think, is a very open and honest God, and the Bible is clear on that. And so he says, if you obey me, talking to the Israelite people, I will give you rain and harvest and peace, and security, and victory, and children, and surplus, and freedom. But he also was very clear. If you disobey me, I will bring terror, and disease, and drought, and wild animals, and plague, and famine, and defeat, and exile, and fear. Now we have the record of scripture. Which of these did Israel do? The second one, all right? <laughs> Mostly what we read about in Scripture is from the book of Judges on, right? In Joshua, they're kind of doing the first one, right? You have this, this whole generation that seems to be very obedient, right? And they're blessed by giving the land. But once you hit the book of Judges, it goes downhill and it goes downhill fast. Yes, sir? Is obedience that was on the previous slide, is that based on, like, literally law, like calling the law, if you screw up, like, it's over? Or is that based on, like, righteousness, like, kind of like what we have today? So it's based on adherence to the law that they were given. So like, uh, adherence to the law. So obeying the, the law of the land and obeying the religious law. Right? Many, many times God will talk about the sacrificial system. Right? And he says, this is what you're supposed to do. So like you can eat your animals, whatever, but, but the offering animal, the offering to children, you need to bring them to the city that God designs. Right? And he tells them exactly how, what to do and how to worship him. Right? And what does he say all the time about idols in the land? Don't do it. Don't do it. Right? You can't say it. He says it like a thousand million times. Right? So wasn't the Ten Commandments um, uh, what they were supposed to follow? Is uh, Sure. Yeah. So the Ten Commandments would be part of the moral law. Yeah. Right? Ten, part of the moral law, which, quite frankly, many of the Western civilizations are built on yeah. the foundational principles of the Ten Commandments. Uh -huh. For a long, long time in uh, classrooms here in America, they had the Ten Commandments posted on the walls. Did any of you have Ten Commandments on walls in your schools when you were kids? Yeah. 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 This is not in the room. This I can't see. The <laughs> Next week, if you got four eyesight, you got some inside. All right. But yeah, we used to have them hanging in our waiting room in our office, right, till someone stole one out of the waiting room. So this is what, this has been my Ironic. question. My question always is the reason the Jewish people have had so much problem yeah. is because of disobedience to God, yeah. and that's the whole. All the wax, right? All the way down from start all, to finish. All the way through. It's disobedience. Yes. What does God say multiple times? He says it in Samuel. He says it in the book of Psalms. He says that to obey me is better than sacrifice. Yeah. Okay. They got so caught up in the ritualistic, the ritualism of their religion, they forgot about the heart, right? When Jesus, what, what God really wanted, which was for them to serve him with all the heart. Remember, he says, when they asked Jesus, what is the greatest commandment? What is Jesus' answer? Love the Lord your God with all your heart and your soul, right? Love me, love God, right? But God is clear to the Israelite people. Remember, this, this lesson time is on Israel. He's clear to them. These are the benefits if you obey, but these are the these are the uh, punishments if you disobey, right? Joshua leads them in to the Promised Land. It's called Israel in about 1400 BC. Israel will occupy that land from 1400 BC to 70 AD with only a brief period of exile to Assyria and Babylon, right? That kind of covers your entire Old Testament. So Israel occupies the land for how long? 14 centuries. 14 <laughs> centuries, right? 14 centuries. Is there any dispute if you have any inkling of history of who lives in this land, who owns this land, right? Given to them by who? God. By God, in a supernatural way, by the way. You recall how they conquered the land supernaturally? Right? They defeat everybody. God sends terror on the people in front of them. God gives them this land for 14 centuries. And he is very patient with them, is he not? Very patient with them. Yeah. Right? He gives them 14 centuries right? for the brief period of exile. This slide, which you, uh, we won't read in class tonight, this is for you to be able to look at later, is just a timeline of history from Adam right through to Jesus, right? Talking about what happens in the land. And the Bible gives us a record of that. Now, the Bible is not a history book. 
but much of the Bible is history and accurate history. All right. Now we get to tonight and looking at the prophetic nature of, of this portion of Scripture, and we're going to primarily be in the book of Daniel. All right. Daniel prophesied about seventy weeks of history. All right. Seventy weeks of history in Daniel chapter nine. Certainly, if you have your Bibles, you can turn there. All right. Daniel writes this book. Where is he sitting in a comfy palace there in Jerusalem, writing this prophecy with the air conditioner blowing, and his hair blowing in the AC? No, he's not. He's in exile. How did he get to exile? What does that even mean, exile? What does that mean? All right, uh, something that we have zero perspective of here. Maybe unless you served in, in a war and you were captured, or you knew someone who was, we have, as Americans, we, have, we don't understand this concept, what happened here. But Rex is exactly right. The occupying power comes in, defeats them, and hauls these kids off completely away from their homeland and takes them to a completely different place, right, to Babylon. And this is where Daniel is. He's not at home. His homeland is in complete ruins, attacked by the major power of the time, Babylon, and Nebuchadnezzar. And he is given a vision by God of the future. By the way, this vision about the future is of which people? Who is the who is the, who is the vision about? It's about the church? No, it's not about the church. Why is it about the church? Church didn't exist. Church didn't exist. Church didn't exist. Them to think of some religious body with Jews and Gentiles together would not have crossed their mind in the, in the least. No, Daniel was given a prophecy specifically written to, targeted to, the Jewish people, all right? The Israelites, all right? This is a graphical representation of the prophecy of Daniel 70 weeks. Now, the little bars are not, uh, you know, they're, they're symmetrical on the screen just for you to be able to see and read them. Obviously, this portion here is only one week, seven years. Mm -hmm. So compared to the rest, you know, it's not exactly proportional, but you get the idea. What happened here is we know from history, <laughs> Then in 445, starting in Nehemiah, Nehemiah chapter 2, this period of time starts with the decree of Artaxerxes, Artaxerxes to rebuild the city of Jerusalem. And then that prophecy runs for 490 years, and it ended when Jesus comes in on the colt, the foal of a donkey, at what day? When did that occur? We celebrate it today. The week before Easter. On Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday, this prophecy paused. So there were 70 weeks, and 69 weeks of this prophecy, just boom, 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 comes right up to Palm Sunday, and then the prophecy stops. It just pauses. There's a week left. So maybe God got it wrong, right? Yeah. Maybe he just got a week wrong. Maybe he got the count off, right? No, it's not the case. What we're going to see is that, like some prophetic, prophetic passages, there was a partial fulfillment, and there was a future fulfillment. All right, so what scripture teaches is that there is going to be another week of years, a seven year period of time. Tribulation. And that period of time we call the tribulation. Why do we call it that? Because the Bible calls it that. <laughs> All right, we don't get to pick the names. We call it that because the Bible calls it that. The Bible will also call it a time of Jacob's trouble. Yeah. Right, the Bible has many names for this period of time. There is a seven year period of time separated by an event at three and a half years. We're going to talk about that event, not tonight, but in future weeks. There is a future seven-week period of time where God will focus on what people? The Jewish people. All right. Now, what happens often in Bible prophecy where people get confused is they confuse who the prophecy is written to. Daniel's prophecy is very clearly written to Jewish people. All right. So Daniel will say that God has given him this prophecy of 70 weeks in the future. For him, it was all in the future, right? But since his death, we have seen 483 of those years, of those 490 years, fulfilled. But there is one week still left to be fulfilled. Let's move ahead. And this just takes what I talked about. 69 of the 70 weeks have already been fulfilled, starting with the decree of our text, so to rebuild Jerusalem, and up to the triumphant entry of the Messiah, Jesus, on Palm Sunday. One week of years. One week of years is how many years? Seven years. By the way, if you want to read a detailed synopsis on this prophecy and its fulfillment, how it was literally fulfilled by lunar years, right? You count, uh, if you look at the Jewish, uh, the, the Jewish calendar, not the uh, 
whatever you call our calendar. What's our calendar? Yeah, so, yeah, we use a solar calendar. They use a lunar calendar. You can read this wonderful book by Sir Robert Anderson called The Coming Prince. I have it in my library if anybody wants to borrow it. You can buy it online. Uh, he is a J. Warner Wallace, for those of us who love apologetics of his time. Anyone who J. Warner Wallace is? All right, who is he? Well, he's a homicide detective who became a Christian after being an atheist and he's written a few books, Forensic Faith, Cold Case Christianity, and God's Crime Scenes. Wonderful, detailed, uh, analytical mind. Yeah. And that's kind of who Sir Robert uh, Anderson was. Just, he was not a clergyman. He was a, he was a lay person who just wanted to study this prophecy. And he lays it all out. And it's just wonderful um, insight that God has given him. So we see that the Jewish Israelite people were set aside for a period of time not seen by the Old Testament prophets. They didn't see it. That's okay. A period of time that we now call the church age. This is the period of time in which we now live, right? A time where God, the gospel is offered to all people, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. I don't know if any of you guys are in here are, are Jewish believers, but praise the Lord if you are, right? What nationality, by the way, was Jesus? He was Jewish. All, all the first disciples were what nationality? What ethnicity? They were Jewish. Praise the Lord. Right? To the Jew first and then to the Greek. Right? If you're not, you're not Jew, then you're a Greek. All right? That's a generic term for us. The rest of us. All right? The Bible's going to say that the church age is going to end at some point. All right? And there's some dispute on this, and that's okay. What I'm going to teach tonight is going to be what our, what our church teaches about um, eschatology. Right? But the church age will end with an event called the rapture of the church. And then will God will bring about the 70th week of Daniel's prophecy, the last seven years of human history prior to the second coming of Christ, a time focused specifically on what kind of people? Jewish. The Jewish people. All right. Have we made that point clear enough? Yet? <laughs> All right. Now, let's talk about Israel. God prophetically and supernaturally allowed the return of the Jewish people to their ancestral land, something that is probably, I don't, I'm not sure that there's any other indication in history of this happening. Right? Most times when a civilization or a culture is wiped out, it's wiped out, never returned. Right? You think about what? The Mayan civilization, civilization, you think about many civilizations. Uh, but the Jewish people, gone since AD 70, right? And then back on May 14, 1940. Any of you around to see that event? No. You were? No. You guys were? It, it's your birthday? That's your birthday? Oh. Okay, well, your birthday was in 1948. So Israel was gone from the land for how long? 1900 years. Thank you very much. <laughs> 1900 years and the miraculous reborn is a country. How old is the United States of America? <laughs> Not on the screen. I don't know. Maybe wish that was on the screen. <laughs> what? You can use your fingers. Feel free. Use your fingers. How old is the United States? 250 years old? Yeah. 250 years old? What do you think? What are we in the spec grand scheme of, of uh, history? We're nothing. Yeah. Right? We're nothing. Yet God has blessed us and put us in uh, in his providence will for a period of time. Right? I think that time is waning. Yes. Uh, because we were but, obedient. Yeah, because of our disobedience. Exactly right. In fact, you look at what happened to Israel, we're just right in that cycle. Yeah, in fact, right. the land of the book of Judges, if you just compare it to what's happening in our land today. 1900 years gone. Now the people weren't gone. Where were the people? Dispersed. Just dispersed. Right? Where? Have you ever, anyone gone anywhere where there aren't a little small enclave of Jewish people? I mean, they're everywhere. Right? They're everywhere. Right? God's preservation of the people. And by the way, many of those Jews still preserved their religion. Right? And they still preserved their language. We're going to talk about that tonight as well. But 1900 years gone. And then back, right? Many of the prophecies of the return to the land had a short-term fulfillment in the return after the Babylonian exile, but many are seeing long-term fulfillment today, right? And many more will see fulfillment in the millennial kingdom. We're going to talk a lot about that this um, this eight weeks. Some prophecies, oh, we just talked about that. Some prophecies will not see their complete fulfillment until the millennial kingdom. All right, here's a prophecy that has been fulfilled, right? We're going to do a couple <laughs> fulfillments tonight, and we're going to look at some unfulfilled ones. From Jeremiah chapter 23. Therefore, behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when they shall no longer say, as the Lord lives who brought up the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt, but as the Lord lives who brought up and led the offspring of the house of Israel out of the north country, out of all the countries where he has driven, and then they shall dwell in their own land. Has that happened? Absolutely that's happened, right? 
Psalm 107, let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from trouble and gathered in from the lands from the east and from the west and from the north and the south. Bible prophecy talking about exactly what we see today. Ezekiel, I will bring you out from the peoples and gather you out of the countries where you are scattered and with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm and with wrath poured out. Have we seen this happen? Was there wrath poured out, by the way, when, when the nation of Israel was born? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. yes, there was. Right? On whom? Who is the wrath for now on? Their enemies. Their enemies, right? Their enemies who try to destroy them, right? We're going to talk about that specifically tonight. In fulfillment of Bible prophecy, God supernaturally allowed to return the Jewish people to their ancestral land. Not only did they reform as a nation, but they reformed as a nation where? In Israel, yeah. Yeah. right? In their ancestral land. Yeah. Right, that doesn't happen in the United States. What we took the Native Americans, we stuck them on reservations around, right? Yeah. Right, that's most often what happens when countries move people around, right? Israel shows up out of nowhere after the Holocaust and they end up back in their own land. Unthinkable. It's God, it's God, it's God. This is uh, the Palestine Post headlines, all right? Headlines from May 1948. The state of Israel was born. All kind of other headlines you can read there. Go back and look at these. Mm -hmm. Zionists proclaim the new state of Israel. Truman recognizes and hopes for peace. <laughs> Tel Aviv is bombed and Egypt orders an invasion. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Immediately. Immediately they're under attack. Right? God supernaturally allows them. But in 19 years, so they get attacked right away at the beginning, but in 19 years you see a major offensive against this tiny state. 19 years. So just think about this. The country gets formed. Right? How long does it take to get your politicians in place and the, the things of government working smoothly? Come on, that takes some time, right? But in 19 years, in 1967, the newly formed nation of Israel is attacked on all sides. And what was the intent of the attackers? Destroy them. Wipe them out. We're going to wipe them out, all right? Despite the fact that the world had said, we're going to give these people this tiny little sliver of land after the Holocaust, right? We're going to give them this tiny little sliver of land. The nations around them said, no, 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 we're just going to wipe them out. We're just going to just kill them, right? Let's watch this video together. Today is the state of Israel shocked the world as it fought against five surrounding nations to not only defeat their enemy, but gain a stronghold on the entire region. How did Israel win the Six-Day War? From June 5th until June 10th, 1967, Israel fought against the surrounding and regional nations of Egypt, Syria, Jordan, Iraq, and Lebanon in what became a watershed moment for the recently formed nation. What followed was nothing short of miraculous, as events swung heavily in favor of the tiny nation of Israel. In the weeks before war broke out, the mood of the Israelis was foreboding. And in the words of David Rubinger, a photographer during the conflict, in the weeks before the war, there was a sense of doom. The national stadium was prepared for 40,000 graves, and even if we thought we might win, it would be a costly victory. The Israelis were heavily outnumbered and outgunned by the Arab nations, who had over half a million troops, almost 1,000 combat aircraft, and over 2,500 tanks, compared to Israel's army, which consisted of 300 aircraft, 800 tanks, and a quarter million troops. However, a monumental amount of preparation was made by the Israeli Defense Force, or IDF. Military procedures were finessed and calculations were made years in advance to determine how many fighter jets Israel could have in the air at any one moment. The process of landing, refueling, rearming, and returning to the air was minimized. The Israeli Air Force could turn a jet around in eight minutes and complete this procedure for all its aircraft up to eight times a day. The events began with Operation Focus a preemptive strike carried out by the Israeli Air Force as they bombed the Egyptian air bases. Egypt transmitted false reports claiming to have been successful in the conflict, which led to Syria and Jordan initiating strikes against Israel. Israel's preparations paid off, and by the end of the first day of the conflict, Israel had achieved air superiority. Over the next five days, the IDF went on the offensive on three fronts, advancing into the Gaza Strip, the Sinai Peninsula, the West Bank, including East Jerusalem and the Golan Heights. Casualties for the Arab nations were very heavy and extreme for such a short period of time. Over 20,000 Arab soldiers were killed or missing compared to less than 1,000 Israeli soldiers. 
A number of reports from the conflict recorded how Arab civilians and local militia confused the Israeli forces with those of Iraq. Colonel Uri Benari gave an account of this when they captured the West Bank town of Shechem. At the entrance to Shechem stood thousands of Arabs who waved white handkerchiefs and clapped their hands. In our naivete, we returned greetings and smiles. We entered the town and wondered, we are advancing and there is no disorder, no panic. The local armed guards stand by with rifles in their hands keeping order, and the crowds are cheering. I didn't comprehend what had transpired. Only later did I understand. The residents of Shechem thought that we were the Iraqi forces who were due to arrive from the direction of Jordan. Other eyewitness accounts speak of panic-stricken Syrian troops who became paralyzed and were unable to return fire. Unexploded shells that landed atop a munitions vehicle and the inexplicable lack of response from Egyptian and other Arab forces when fighting first broke out. In just six days, Israel had achieved victory over insurmountable odds and had tripled the area of land under Israeli control including the religious sites of East Jerusalem. According to biblical prophecy, the Jews who were largely removed from the land of Israel for the past two millennia would once again inhabit Jerusalem. The scriptures which predicted this were written roughly 2,500 years ago, yet we find ourselves today with a bitter Jewish-Palestinian conflict which prior to these mid-20th century events would have been unbelievable. If a text from 2,500 years ago could accurately prophesy who would control Jerusalem, perhaps we should consider what this text also states. For I will gather all the nations to battle against Jerusalem. The city shall be taken. Half of the city shall go into captivity. With a current population of around 900,000, the Jewish population in Jerusalem, according to the Israeli Central Bureau of Statistics, is just over half a million. Which half of the city will go into captivity, and what other events will occur around this time? For more information, you can read or request a print copy of our free booklet titled oh, You Can uh, Listen to more of that on their website. There, there is a link at the end of all of our sessions, all of our PowerPoint presentations for this series, we'll have all a, bibli a bibliography of all the things that we've used. And so you can find out more information from their website. But uh, Israel starts off in 1948, and they don't even have quite the walls to the, the, the religious sites of East Jerusalem. Less than 19 years later, they tripled their landmass. Attack on all sides, and they went. Did you hear what he described about what happened to the uh, other forces? What were some of the words that he described happened to the other forces? Paralyzed, Paralyzed. <laughs> confused, a fear. When the nation of Israel get ready, went, got ready to go into the promised land under Joshua's leadership, you know what God said he would do to the people in the land? He would paralyze them, confuse them, and make them afraid. Mm -hmm. And this is God. This is God giving this young country a victory. This is the fulfillment of Bible prophecy. Yes, sir. Yeah, I think the Lord gave uh, Israel uh, real wisdom because they had studied how to protect themselves for years. Yes. Not, not, I mean, not too many years because it had been existing back right, then. Right. But during that time that they first formed up until six-day war, they had done a lot of investigation, so they knew their enemies, they knew the air bases, you know, mm -hmm. the, the, uh, the, the government buildings, you know, all this stuff, and they had all, already programmed into their system ways that they could immediately attack these objects, yes. and when they decided to attack first, that's that's why they won. Yeah. They destroyed so much in their surprise attack. That they had achieved air superiority. Yeah. Yeah, it was a military victory, right? But it wasn't just a military victory, no, Lord, right? Yeah. Right? It was military victory achieved because of the Lord. Of the Lord. Exactly right. And who gave them wisdom and discernment? The Lord. And that was the Lord, right? And we're going to see that. As we look at the future prophecies, we're going to see, uh, specifically we talk about Jerusalem. He references it there in Zechariah. Jerusalem is in for a cup of trembling, right? It's not going to be all uh, giggles and daisies for the Jewish people in the time ahead. It's going to be quite tough uh, for them, and so we need to pray for them. One of the Bible verses tells us in Scripture to pray for the peace of Jerusalem, right? When we pray that prayer, by the way, what are we actually praying for? That the only peace will be when he comes back. We're praying for the return of Christ. You're exactly right. Because the actual peace of that city will not occur. It will, be, it will not be because some American president hops on a plane and does anything. Right? Won't be, be certainly won't be because an American president decides to, to divide the land. 
right? It'll be when Jesus Christ steps foot on the Mount of Olives. So Trump made Jerusalem the capital. Yes. That's where we moved our embassy. Moved the embassy. Mm -hmm. He what? recognized, right? He didn't make well, it. No, I mean, it made it happen, but he recognized it being such. Yes. Is that prophetic? Uh, no, I wouldn't say that incident or that okay. particular thing was prophetic, right? Because God had already said that Jerusalem is the capital, right? Right. Jerusalem is his capital. That specific city, Jerusalem, as we're going to see, is going to be the eternal capital. Yeah. Right? It's the capital, regardless of who recognizes it or not. Right. I'm not going to understate the fact that uh, the president of the United States at the time, was Donald Trump, recognized the city. I think it was a wonderful move, uh, yeah. uh, biblically, on his part. Uh, and you've seen other countries fall in line. But if, even when it was established in 1948, yeah. Jerusalem was not the capital. That's correct. And also, um, it was under British... Uh, the British mandate. Mandate. Yeah. Yeah. Until the British moved out, that's when this yes. incident happened. Yes, correct. Yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot behind here. We can't go yeah. into all of this. No, 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 no. But it's no, fascinating no. to to no. see how how God moves the chess pieces, right? Mm -hmm. Which is what He's doing right now. Which we'll get into week three when we talk about yeah. war, yeah. as God moves the pieces in place to fulfill His prophetic plan. Because what He says will happen is absolutely going to happen, mm -hmm. and we don't know when, but we know it will. Right? Let's yeah. move forward. Okay. Uh, talking about who owns the land and who determines who occupies the land, Leviticus, That's Joshua, right. Psalm, it's actually John MacArthur, pastor, all through scripture. Author, and Bible teacher was Look, raised to you. Wes, would you like to know? <laughs> you don't like our lesson. We can yes. serve your <laughs> lesson. Well, right. well, does John MacArthur have some time? He's a believer, too. What are you watching? Well, watching. <laughs> there is not that. Sorry, we'll either edit that out of the video or we'll leave it in. Why not? <laughs> I told you, wait for the jokes. Yes, did. He did say he was going to throw things, a few things in tonight just to throw me off. Very good. That was good. I didn't see that one coming. Right? God owns the land, right? The point being, God owns the land, right? God determines who occupies the land. Right now, we have uh, nations around the world that are that are hell bent on dividing this land, right? I don't think we should be doing that. You know why I don't think we should be doing that? God owns the land. God has determined who will live in this land. And by the way, when you read the text of scripture, it's pretty clear that it is futile for mankind to fight against God's plan. All right? A lot of scriptures here. Psalm 2, if you haven't read Psalm 2 lately, it's a wonderful psalm. Say so God just simply sits back and laughs at mankind. Yeah. Right? When they try to go against his plan. Right? Uh, you can try. Right? In the very end, right? The entire world assembles to fight against God. It doesn't go well for them. It's just not worth it. I'd encourage you, if you're not in here tonight, you're watching online, go fight against God. <laughs> it won't go well for you. Right? Not, don't waste your time. All right? Modern day Israel. The actual nation state of Israel is absolutely fulfilling biblical prophecy, not only in its existence today, right? We, we made that very clear, but in its growth and excellence. And it's an absolute testimony to God and his prophetic word. Now I have a video for us to watch. This video, by the way, is not done by Christians. This video was done by Jews, right? But listen to what the Jews have to say. The tiny state of Israel has become world famous for its extraordinary achievements in so many fields. Jewish immigrants from all over the world returned to their homeland, revived its barren wilderness, rebuilt its ruins, and revitalized their ancient language, creating an economic military, social, cultural, and technological power marveled at the world over. Amazingly, these achievements were all clearly foretold by our biblical prophets who described them so vividly. Let's briefly look at the fulfillment of 10 remarkable prophecies which are all a living reality in Israel today. And he will gather you in from all the nations to which the Lord your God has scattered you. Perhaps the greatest miracle of all an unparalleled return to a land of epic proportions. Listen to this. In 1840, there were 6,000 Jews living in the land of Israel. By the time of the Balfour Declaration in 1917, the number grew to 60,000. And the state was declared in 1948, there were 600,000. And today, over 6 million, 6.7 million Jews. The Jewish population of the land climbed from being a tiny fraction of 1% world Jewry to 6% in 1948, which is almost half of all the Jews in the world today. This miraculous gathering is perhaps a greater miracle than the exodus from Egypt itself in three different ways. Firstly, the 
speaks in this claim of 200 years of slavery, whereas the return to modern Israel happened after 2,000 years. Secondly, all the Israelites came out of one country, Egypt, whereas in the modern era, from over 100 countries. And thirdly, in Egypt, all Jews lived in one culturally segregated ghetto in Goshen, speaking only Hebrew, whereas in Israel today, Jews have returned from every possible cultural and ideological background, speaking over 80 languages, somehow all forged into one functional society. An incredible miracle in human history. I will make the land desolate, and your adversaries who dwell in it will be desolate too. Following the Roman conquest of 70 CE, the Jews went into exile. Thereafter, the land of Israel was conquered by 14 different empires over 1900 years. But as the Lord had foretold, the land would remain barren to its conquerors despite repeated attempts to make it flourish. As if the land itself was waiting for the return of her children. In 1867, Mark Twain famously described the land he saw, a desolation, repulsive and dreary, with hardly a tree or shrub anywhere, a land covered in sackcloth and ashes. Until, of course, the return of the Jews. But you, O mountains of Israel, give forth your branches and bear your fruits for my people Israel, for they are soon to come. As the Jewish people has returned to the land, the land has somehow returned to them. The desert has become an oasis and the desolation a blessing. Israel very quickly started developing world-class agricultural expertise and cutting-edge water conservation technologies despite the dry climate and vast arid lands. The returning Jews planted over 250 million trees and Israel is the only nation on earth that entered the 21st century with more trees than it had 100 years before. It's more than 300 wineries and its grapes, olives and citrus fruit production are exported the world over. And if you think that is remarkable, listen to this. For then I will make the nations change to speak one clear language. At the time that the first pioneers began returning to the land, the Hebrew language itself was not a spoken language. No Jewish community and not one Jewish family spoke to their children in Hebrew. Hebrew was a language of prayer and scholarship, but not a spoken language as it had been in biblical times. Herzl, with all his great vision for a return to Zion, did not believe that Hebrew could be revived. He believed that German and Yiddish would be the spoken language. Miraculous, Hebrew has become the lingua franca in Israel, spoken by 10 million people the world over, and is the only language in recorded history to have been revived by a people as their spoken language. And of course, Hebrew is the language of the Torah itself. For out of Zion shall go forth Torah and the word of God from Jerusalem. In the early years of the state, you could fit all your Shiva students in Israel into one small hall. At the zenith of Lithuanian Jewry, there were no more than 3,000 people learning Torah full time. In Israel today, there are close to 200,000 men and women engaged fully in Torah learning of all worldviews, traditional Yeshivot, Yeshivot Yazdir, Midrashot Mechinot, and more. There are more people learning Torah in Israel today than arguably at any other time in all of Jewish history. And he will do good to you and make you more numerous than your forefathers. The Jewish population in Israel has increased 10 times since 1948. Its economy has grown 40 times. According to The Economist, Israel has doubled its GDP in the past decade alone, a world record. Recently, Israel's GDP surpassed both France and Great Britain, and according to Bloomberg, Israel's economic stability ranks third in the world. But when it comes to the cows, we rank at number one. And he gave us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. The average Israeli cow produces 12,000 liters of milk per year. This is the highest in the world, more than countries such as the United States and Holland, which are renowned for their dairy production. Even the cows in Israel are holy. Honey refers to the date honey, and the large sweet dates of the Jordan Valley are amongst the finest in the world. Jerusalem will be settled beyond her walls because of the multitude of people. Jerusalem, the beating heart of Israel. For centuries the city was off limit to Jews. The prophet envisioned Jerusalem's population growing so large that its walls would not accommodate inhabitants. Until recently this seemed impossible. In 1860 Jews began moving beyond the walls and Jerusalem today is home to over 900,000 inhabitants, 600,000 Jews, the largest city in Israel today and all nations on earth will be blessed through you.
despite the tiny size of Israel, there is almost no significant technological advancement which takes place today without Israel's know-how and expertise. Global advancements in sciences, medicine, agriculture, and high-tech have Israel's fingerprints all over them. Jews the world over have won Nobel Prizes in an array of fields disproportionate to any other people, and 12 Israelis have won Nobel Prizes, more than China, despite it being 150 times larger than Israel's population. Israel has the largest concentration of startups per capita anywhere in the world, and has been dubbed the startup nation, and by others, the innovation nation, ensuring that its innovations are a source of blessing to all of humanity. Nations will see your righteousness, and all the kings your honor. The development of Israel's foreign relations during the last 30 years is staggering. The number of countries that have diplomatic relations with Israel has doubled from 80 to 160. Recently, the Abraham Accords and some of Israel's Arab neighbors broke areas previously seen impossible, and somehow Israel has been able to turn sworn foes into friends. Israel's achievements in and of themselves are staggering, whether it be the realm of science or the spirit, technology or Torah, nation building or universal blessing. For example, many countries are looking to learn from Israel's success, being the first country to vaccinate the entire adult population against COVID-19. Even more astounding is that the destiny of this country seems less about politics and more about prophecy. Not just a new phenomenon, but rather a reincarnation of an ancient one, a modern saga clearly foretold by the biblical seers of old who saw the story of Israel as a central piece of the fulfillment of human history and our collective destiny. <laughs> Call what they call that language in their country. You know, they, they have a trade language. They have a there's yeah. a specific name for yeah. their their language. I don't know if it's I don't know if it is their official language of the country. I'd have to look that up. But it's, it's it would be Hebrew. But it's been revived. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. It, when you listen to Netanyahu speak or um, many of their politicians, yeah. you know, he speaks in Hebrew. Mm-hmm. He also That's speaks amazing. in Amazing. I didn't realize that it, they had 80 different languages. So I'm not surprised. Like well, people coming from all yeah. over the world. Yeah. Yeah. Six percent of the world population is already in Israel. Yeah. Up in Jerusalem, I didn't know. Wow. By the way, you saw all of that. They were just—they have ten Hebrew. things, right? A prophetic fulfillment. Yeah. Is it? Yes, Hebrews are spoken. Their national language is Hebrew. Yeah. Oh, there you go. Yeah. How long has oh, Israel oh, been in existence, by the way? All of this, by the way, happened in how long? Seventy years. Seventy something years. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Seventy something years. How long has the United States been around? Two fifty. And they've done this in 70. Mm-hmm. Just remarkable. But Just you know, remarkable. The uniqueness of what happened is all, all those things came from all different places around the world. Like even from the Depression, there were, there were Jewish people that were working in the West. I read a book about it, I don't remember the name of it, to teach them. Everybody had the great drought and all that. Mm-hmm. They, they had to move and stuff. They were there still learning how to till the soil, how to you know, do everything. And they took that wisdom that they learned, even from Nazi Germany, mm-hmm. even from, from Russia, they took all that, and when they went back to their homeland, which God promised to them, they had all this set up, and God was showing them along that you're going to eventually end up there. Have any of you been to Israel? Uh, yeah, I've been there. I'd love to go. It's absolutely stunningly gorgeous. Mm. I wouldn't even know it today, yeah. mm. you know, the way it was. Stunning. Yeah. Yeah. You saw? Did you see what Mark Twain said when he visited? His yeah. quote from yeah, that? Yeah, yeah. It's absolutely yeah. so This place is ridiculous. Oh, yeah. yeah the, the, That's amazing thing, the amazing thing. The amazing thing to where the Lord used the United States, and especially Britain, yes. is when when uh, Israel was established, Britain uh, officially recognized it immediately, mm-hmm. and then the United States soon followed. Mm-hmm. Because Britain and the United States had biblical knowledge. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, of course. Mm-hmm. yeah, God always has his people in the right place. Yeah. Mm-hmm. God's people are always in the right place mm-hmm. at the right time, right? That's the story of Esther, right? The whole biblical mm-hmm. historical, mm-hmm. I'm use story, historical account of Esther, right? God has his people in the right place at the right time for such a time as, as this, which is why he has us in this place at such a time as this. Right? To study biblical prophecy, to realize its complete utter relevance to today's events, and not to be discouraged, right? Because we know what's coming. And we're talking more about that next, the next seven weeks. God right now, right now, is setting the stage of world events for the 70th week to be fulfilled. Right? 
Daniel 9 and 12 predict a new temple will be rebuilt in Jerusalem, and that sacrifices and offerings will resume at that temple until the Antichrist will be stopped and requires himself to be worshipped. Has anyone heard any talk about a potential new temple to be built in Jerusalem? No. So. Absolutely have. Yeah. Just read the paper. <clears throat> right? Here's a website that's specifically devoted to this particular task called the templeinstitute.org. But there are others calling for a temple to be rebuilt. This is a, a digital image of recreation of what could be. There's plenty of room. You can put up that temple mm -hmm. mount. There's plenty of room for them to build another structure up there. Mm -hmm. yeah. This is uh, located potentially adjacent to the dome. But on that temple mount, there's the dome, which is the, the rock inside, right? It's a, it's a museum type thing. Yeah. And then the mosque is over here. You just don't see it in this particular picture. Uh, but there's plenty of room if they wanted to build a third edifice up there. Is that how it's going to happen? I don't know. We don't know. doesn't matter. We don't have to know the specifics. We just know that it'll happen, right? right. Zechariah 12, 2 and 3. This is talking about the future of Jerusalem. Behold, I'm about to make Jerusalem a cup of staggering to all the surrounding peoples. The siege of Jerusalem will also be against Judah. And on that day, I'll make Jerusalem a heavy stone for all the peoples. All who lift it will surely hurt themselves. And all of the nations of the earth will gather against it. The Bible prophecy states that Jerusalem will be a, a stumbling block to the nations around it. And eventually, all the nations of the earth will come uh, against, its, against its walls. Mm -hmm. right? Now, we're going to talk about that. So yes, this is talking about yeah. future prophecy, right? But you can already see that that there's potential for war of all the time, right? Last was it last week they were throwing the rockets, or two weeks ago? How long ago was it? That they shot four thousand rockets, right? Uh, and a few of them at the city of Jerusalem, although most were not in Jerusalem, right? So the future for Israel, according to Bible prophecy, is a time of great testing, but also of great spiritual revival, right? Who, when God calls this this nation out of out of the Ur, out of uh, Ur of the Chaldees, out of Mesopotamia, and he calls Abraham, he calls this nation to be his special people. And who is that nation? It's Israel. Is it the church? No. no. The church is something special. It's something unique. It's something the prophets didn't see. God loves the people of Israel. We're not here to defend, absolutely not here to defend, all the decisions of the current Israeli government or future Israeli governments. That's not the point of what we're talking about here. We're looking at the spiritual aspect, the biblical, prophetical aspect of the nation of Israel. Not specific politicians, not specific policies of uh, the Jewish nation, right? Just like we don't, we're not looking at specific people or politicians or policies of the United States government, right? Mm -hmm. God uses the current people in power no matter who they are. Right. And he will use them for his purposes, right? The right. uh, Bible says that he puts people into place and he takes people away, mm -hmm. right? It is God's purview. So if you happen to be a politician or you have friends who are politicians, tell them to be on their high horse. Mm -hmm. All right? They're in there for whatever time they're in there. Oh, so we do have one in the room. Uh, right? They're there for, a, for however long they're there, but they could be gone just like that too. Right? Yeah. right? So During Daniel's 70th week, God will supernaturally preserve a remnant of believing Jewish people who will enter the millennial kingdom and see the fulfillment of the land grant of the Abrahamic covenant. You go all the way back to the book of Genesis, the Jewish people, God's people, are prophetically given a portion of land. They have yet to have gotten all of that land. That's right. They will get all that land in the millennial kingdom when Jesus Christ is ruling and reigning in the city of Jerusalem, the capital city of Jerusalem. We'll talk about that in our weeks coming up. Here's our final thought for tonight. What we wanted to open with is to show that God's word is absolutely positively reliable. Mm -hmm. Right? That when he says something is going to happen, it happens. Now, we don't know exactly how it's going to happen. A lot of times you look back and see exactly how it happened, as we do with the 483 years of the 490. We can look back and see exactly how it was fulfilled to the jot and tittle of the prophecy, right? Well, let's just talk for just for a moment about the future of Jerusalem. We hinted at this earlier today, right? Jerusalem right now is, is uh, kind of divided, right? There's a, a walled city with you guys know how many quarters are in, well, if you use the word, you should know how many quarters are in the city. Four. 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 I should have said a different, a different yeah. mathematical term. Yeah. I was hoping someone would say three. When we talk about that. All right, so four. I gave it away. Four quarters. Do you know what they are? North, east, west. One, two, three, four. Would not be correct. If we're playing Jeopardy, that would be an incorrect answer. It was also not the number of questions. Yeah, right? that is north, east, west. So it's the Muslim quarter, the Jewish quarter, the Christian quarter. 
and uh, everybody can it's the Arab, Maybe it's Arab, not Muslim. And then there's the one that's the, that group, of, the group of Christians that are... Um, Orthodox, no? Not Catholic. Oh, it's the fourth one. You can look it up. <laughs> <laughs> I should know it, but I can't remember because you know, I'm on video and I'm on the spot. Oh, yeah. All right, but there are there are different groups of people just living within that little walled city, right? But then you, if you look outside the city, this massive city of Jerusalem that people are living outside those walls. Um, it's just a massive, massive, beautiful city. Uh, but that's not the Jerusalem that we're going to be talking about, right? Because the future of Jerusalem ultimately will be the capital city for Jesus in the millennial kingdom. Scripture is very clear on that. All right, Jesus will return to this earth. He will set up a kingdom, a physical kingdom, and he will rule and reign out of this capital city. Multiple uh, texts of scripture talk about this. Here's just a couple of them. And then the new Jerusalem, which is talked about in the last two chapters of the Bible. The new Jerusalem talked about the eternal state, right? The new Jerusalem will be the, the dwelling place of the saints in Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 to 3. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. Now I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. By the way, that's what the Garden of Eden was. Remember? Mm -hmm. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, which was what God's plan was all along before we screwed it up. Mm -hmm. And God himself will be with them as their God. Mm -hmm. This is an artist's rendition based on the dimensions of the New Jerusalem, what it might look like. Mm -hmm. right, this massive uh, cube-type structure that you read about in Scripture. That will be the home of the saints. And it is just remarkable when you read what God has planned to do. Yeah, is it uh, 1,500 miles high, yeah. wide, and yes. uh, long? I mean, it's, it's unfathomable, yeah. right? Which is what eternity is, right? Ooh, right. God says in his word that man has not seen, Ooh. man cannot comprehend what God has in store for his people. Uh, the wonderful story of scripture is that God made man in his image a relationship with God, and then we went and just botched it up. Yeah. We screwed it up, and we screw it up all the time. Every day. Every day. Every right? day. We are sinners, yeah. right? But then God then sent his son to pay the penalty for our sin, right? It is the truth and the hope of the gospel that he sent his son Jesus to be the Messiah, right? To fulfill Old Testament prophecy, not to replace the Old Testament, but to fulfill it, right? And then to give us a hope for the future. And so he promises that if you repent of your sins and you trust Christ as your Savior, then you become what we call a Christian. You put him first as Lord of your life, and you live for him. And we have to obey, by the way. Right? Even the promises then are blessings if we obey, the promises are the same. Right? He gives us the uh, Ten Commandments not to control our lives, but to give us guidelines. Guidance. Right? Bumpers on the bumper end, right? to keep us in. You can take the bumpers down, but you often end up in the gutter. Right? Right. Great analogy for the Christian life, right? That God will forgive you of your sins if you repent and accept Him. And this is the future of storm, right? The Bible promises the prophecies that He has in store for the future of eternity is what He promises to His saints. He also promises the future for those who reject Him, and that's an eternity in hell. And He doesn't want people to go there. But if you end up there, you are chosen there. That's right. So it's up to you what you want to do. You can choose to listen, believe, and obey. Or you can choose to not listen, reject, and live life the way you want to live it. And God won't force you. He said, absolutely not. So let's close the word of prayer, and then we'll do some, maybe some Q&A, and then we'll, we'll end for tonight. All right. Lord God Almighty, thank you for tonight. Thank you for the privilege to open your word. Uh, many passages in the Old Testament, Lord, as we see your prophetic word, your supernatural, um, outside of time, uh, prophetic word, where you predicted the future, you predicted it completely accurately. So, Lord, we look at that, and we give you praise, and we give you glory, for you are God and God alone. And so, Lord, we thank you for the privilege that you have given us this word, that you have revealed yourself to us, and that you've given us the gift of the Holy Spirit so that we can understand. But thank you for this opportunity tonight just to review what you have done, to see your prophetic fulfillment happening right now, today, as we live. It is such an exciting time to be alive. Lord, help us to be a blessing to others, to point people to you and to your word. Lord, we pray that you would go before us, that you would open the hearts of our friends and co-workers and neighbors and loved ones who don't know you yet. Lord God, I just pray uh, the desire of our heart that they would come to know you, that you would open their blind eyes, and that you would bring them salvation. So we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Man, if you would shut that off, we'll...
do Q and A because I don't want to get I can't even get the full chorus of Jerusalem right. I don't want to get Q and A wrong on video. <laughs>